All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for stopping in for the uh, 15 minutes worth of uh, information we're going to give you on our latest offering in space pack for air to water heat pump technology. Uh, quick question to the group. Who all is familiar or not familiar with air to water heat pump, what it is, how it operates, uh, different applications. So do we know what air to water heat pump is? Show of hands super quick. Anybody not know anything whatsoever? Cool. So we're going to give you so much information in 15 minutes that you're just going to want to go back and uh, research more for the rest of the day. A little bit of background. Space Pack has had air to water heat pumps in North America since about 2011. Uh, I've been the, uh, the, the lucky person, so to say, to be really with this industry since 2011. I was actually fortunate enough to be a contractor and install space pack air to water heat pumps in 2011, some of the very first ones in North America. So to say I've been with the evolution uh, since its infancy is, is kind of an understatement. So I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly, and where we are now is extremely promising. We have thousands of installations across North America. Our inverter series line is our full lineup now. We'll kind of go up that through, but uh, when you become a certified contractor, we've got an industry leading 10 year compressor warranty and five year on the parts, right? We offer uh, certification for contractors throughout North America and Canada. Also, all of our equipment, depending on verbiage, let's say, uh, through different areas and territories within the country are all eligible for rebates. Everybody likes something that's on sale, and we want to make sure we take advantage of that. Why the hydronic or heat pump solution, right? We're an environmentally friendly uh, heating and cooling for residential and light commercial applications, okay? The physics of the hydronic in the water make it a lot easier for moving uh, our BTU heat throughout the home where we may need it and or uh, for cooling and DHW offset. Um, we have all of the advantages of the hydronics, whether it be our radiant, um, tapping into existing systems um, without the, the fossil fuel aspect, right? The solid um, fuel, so to speak. So we can pine the... Uh, performance of the modern air source heat pump with the unsurpassed you know, history and strength of the hydronic market. So our full line of offering now goes from, so we'll just kind of run through it quickly. Uh, we have a monoblock design and a split design. Monoblock design meaning all of the equipment is housed in a nice real uh, unit for outside where we would pipe to it, we would pump to it, we would wire it, and it's basically a self-contained unit that we can turn on and off as needed. We also have a split unit, um, which separates the uh, refrigerant to water exchanger from the outside condenser, allowing there uh, to be a refrigerant line set between the two of them. We also have non-cold climate and cold climate options, meaning a non-cold climate option, even though uh, the definition of heat pump is to allow you to do both heating and cooling, we have units that are more designed or designed better for certain applications. So, even though our non-cold climate unit will do heating and cooling, our cold climate unit is much better for doing heating at low ambient temperatures. And we're talking about ambient temperatures into the, the negative 20 plus degree range, okay? Still giving you a very significant BTU output. We're gonna touch on a little bit of that, not get too technical, but hopefully leave you with a whole lot more questions that you're just gonna come over to our booth or our website and find out some more information on. Probably my favorite slide of all time in the hundreds that we have is this one right here. Um, I call this the picture that paints a thousand words, right? If anybody ever wants to understand the system and how it works and, and understand from a helicopter view that it's not, it's not difficult or hard to understand, we look at this picture, okay? Uh, when I do contractor trainings and a lot of times the initial, oh, what's this air to water? What does it do? For argument's sake, we're a really efficient electric boiler that sets outside your home. Oh, and during the summer, we can do cooling as well. So if we just take a look at this picture here to the right, we think of our solstice air to water heat pump outside as the charger, right? And our buffer tank in the basement or wherever that mechanical room might be located is gonna offer us our thermal storage, our hydronic separation, okay? Our battery, if you will. The purpose of the system to work hand in hand, when that battery gets low, either the temperature draws higher or lower, depending on what mode we're in, the outside unit will turn on and either heat up or chill down that tank as needed to the appropriate temperatures. From there, if we're in an existing home or even a new construction where we're exercising the use of low, I'm sorry, low temperature heating, 
right? Whether it be low temperature baseboard, uh, panel radiators, in-floor radiant, low temperature fan coils, we're basically a hydronic system from there. So in, with contractors that are and engineering firms and, and even homeowners that are already currently familiar with the uh, how hydronics work, maybe they have certain things in their house, we're really, uh, in certain applications, kind of a, um, a really smooth transition to removing said fossil fuel and pushing towards the electrification shift throughout the country. So uh, to kind of help us along with all of this, um, we have some controls and some options for parts and pieces, right? We're gonna create that energy outside. We're gonna store it in our buffer tank. We'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. We also have fan coils and uh, the key to the fan coils is operating at low water temperature, right? Often we get the question, hey, how hot of water can your units make outside? And I said, well, how cool of water can you use to heat your home, right? Because at the end of the day, there could be a fire breathing dragon in the basement. If the load on the home was very low, that dragon would be efficient, right? So you have to start with the project as being designed uh, to work well with this highly energy efficient equipment, right? These lower water temperatures and so on. But we have a series of controls that work with outdoor reset, existing systems, integration of systems. If by chance there's not a, uh, a full and complete utilization of all of the BTUs available at the unit, uh, whether it be fan coils or full whole house air distribution systems. Our buffer tank, um, as I mentioned, the battery, we have those in multiple sizes, right? So uh, again, we're gonna think of this as that battery, as that thermal storage. Even though our units are incredibly efficient, they're also more efficient at two times in life, right? One, when they're off, right? Because we're not drawing any power. And two, when they're running. All of our equipment now has variable speed compressors and fan motors, right? So Although we may call COP, coefficient of performance, as a, as a unit of measure for efficiency on air to water equipment and say, okay, I have a, an efficiency of X when the outside temperature is this and a couple other variables. What uh, inverter technology does is allow that unit to come up uh, based on ambient temperature, uh, set point, distance from set point, and inlet and outlet water temperatures and vary the compressor speed and the fan so that that unit is always running at its most efficient spot, right? Think about it like cruise control for your vehicle. We don't want this. This is not efficient, right? Efficient is coming on, running for a period of time at its most efficient state, and a period of time could be 10, 15, or 20 minutes. We don't want short run cycles, okay? So generally, we're going to use a situation where, hey, our battery is going to have some nice big storage. So when it does come on, my unit gets to turn on and run for a period of time, hit that most efficient state operating conditions, and stay there through the duration of, this, of the runtime until it satisfies. The other thing this allows us to do is really separate our system, right? If we're talking a hydronic system on the inside, and if anybody is familiar with radiant, low temperature baseboard, uh, panel rads, we're not necessarily dealing with very high flow situations. Right? On our heat pump side, we may be. We may be looking at, depending on model, 7, 10, 12, 13 GPM of flow that needs to be sustained for proper operation or proper extraction, right, of the BTUs available on those units at any one given time. So from there, we don't want that to interrupt the flow of the system inside, right? We could have a house with one zone or 15 zones, and well, one of those zones might be a towel bar on the second floor that needs half a gallon a minute, okay? And we don't want that to impact one or the other. So the separation of flows is allowed inside these tanks. We have a line up to 80 gallons uh, plus looking into for the future with built-in electric resistance, okay? So at those times where those homes are reaching their limit, their degree day, their um, design temperature, if you will. And who knows, little Joey, little Susie leaves the, leaves the door open, that temperature drops a little bit quicker than expected in the house. There is some application where boost heat can be called in either during a normal run cycle and or during a defrost cycle. So to touch on our newest unit, which we have over there at the booth, if you want to come and get your pictures taken with it, because we, we love that, you know, and post it up for us, is our low ambient mono block unit, right? So our cold climate unit here. This unit is capable of doing whole house heating, cooling, and DHW. Right? Now, depending on the size of your house and the load, it might do my house, but it might not do your house, right? So each of those applications has to be addressed kind of prior to just saying, I'm not going to chop out a boiler and throw one of these in there, right? A, a, a project assessment would have to be done either by said contractor, engineering firm, 
uh, or even uh, even homeowner right from the beginning. So just a little bit about this unit. Um, it's been uh, it's been a really great tour. I have personally have this unit at my house um, running for quite a few years now. Um, and I'm I'm in upstate New York running at about 18 to 23 cents per kilowatt hour, right? So that's in a range. I've seen as high as five, or as high as 40 something cents in the Santa uh, Santa Cruz area, California, to as low as five cents near Niagara Falls in Western New York, right? So in our country, we're dealing with very volatile market as far as what the electrical cost and consumption is. So the delivered temperatures for our units range anywhere from about 42 degrees up to and above 130. Okay. Again, everybody, hey, how hot can we make the water, right? We want to want more efficient, right? Generally, if we're going to design a system, even if we can hit 130 or 135, we're going to design a system around 120 degrees, 110 degrees, right? The lower the better, as far as that's concerned. We have the capacity there if needed, but if it's not needed, we want to idle that thing back, right? If that is a gasoline engine, we're going to shut off a few cylinders, so to speak, right? Super high efficiency in COPs, low ambient temps, and operating down to negative 22. This monoblock design, as mentioned, kind of everything is self-contained. There's no refrigerant charge on site. Current units are R410A refrigerant. We are looking at transitioning to other um, lower GD, G, oh, GDP refrigerants. Messed that one up. Reliable. This unit has a Toshiba compressor, EVI, so advanced vapor injection allows us to get much more capacity at those low ambience with just a four-ton compressor. And as mentioned before, the fans on all of our inverter units, this one included, very speed. So they may ramp between 200 CFM up to 750. Uh, so similar as the temperature gets warmer outside, the BTU capacity increases on these units. So you may go out and 45 degrees outside and you, you could almost feel like you can count the revolutions on those fans. I need to move less of that warmer air since I'm extracting BTUs from it. Now if we go out and it's zero degrees, those fans are cranking because I need to move as much air across that as possible. So, Oh, GWP. <laughs> so super low GWP and we're could be transitioning to even lower. So freeze protection and uh, defrost is based on coil temperature and pressures integrated in the existing control. User-friendly touchscreen control, super proud of this part of the product because if anything um, that is new is not being able to understand it or control it. So a lot of very clean and easy to understand verbiage on our control that can be remote mounted really up to 600 feet away from that unit outside. A lot of times we may not want our heat pump setting directly outside a building due to aesthetics, due to landscaping and such. We can move it up um, to many hundreds of feet away. And there's been many installations around the country um, that use that option. This is another great picture and it's, and it's more of a testament to let's target our uh, application for and our need for those units based on what we're actually gonna need or temperature in the home to reach that point, okay? So if we target in that, that low temperature range of the 120, 130, we're really looking at being able to cover a lot of what the or a lot of what options are out there commercially uh, for heat distribution, right? Whether we're space pack, uh, um, water-based air handler, uh, panel radiator, ceiling heating, wall heating, any type and any form of the radiant applications as well, right? Air to water heat pumps uh, have the ability to say, hey, listen, if, if I am dealing with this amount of outdoor ambient temperature and I have a target temperature of here, I can supply a certain amount of BTUs. Now, the colder it gets, there is a drop in the BTUs because we're drawing or extracting a BTU value out of the air. But uh, our low ambient unit here, again, not to get too much into the weeds, but we can still deliver in the range of the low 30,000 BTUs at negative 20 uh, of 120 degree water, okay? And that would be all day long every day until something changes outside, right? The ambient temperature changes, we reach set point, or perhaps the unit would go into defrost, which is a short cycle um, that just interrupts the heat making process for no more than eight minutes usually. A couple of pictures of the, uh, the unit outside. What do we have for time? How are we doing? Oh, we got two minutes, so I am flying right here through this stuff. Um, generally speaking, a couple of things. Uh, we reason that, that you can see that on there. Um, a stand made um, for the units. We have those available as well. It's super important in areas where your climate is could be very damp in the wintertime, right? If we're going to be running these um, in areas where 
we're cold, we need heat, but maybe we're not freezing. Maybe the air is not incredibly dry, right? The colder it is, generally the drier the air, we don't have the defrost problem going through. But anytime we do, when these units go into defrost, that means the coil on the back is potentially starting to ice over. We'll transition into what would be cooling mode temporarily, making that outside coil hot and melt all of that ice off, right? And when you melt the ice off, it turns to water, right? And when that water drips, it's gonna come off that unit pretty considerably. So there's a few different ways of um, offering enough elevation to get that defrost, um, condensate that drain out of there. And then of course, it could be something as simple as just building it up alongside the house. Uh, we didn't mention too much about um, noise or decibel ratings, extremely, extremely quiet units. And again, because we're dealing with variable speed compressors, variable speed fans, it is not going to run any harder than it needs to, none of our products. So I can promise you, it'd be a, if it was running right here, there would be nobody that heard it. You guys might feel it in the front because there'll be some air blowing on you, but completely drowned out. Um, well, a lot of times we put these in the units and we have a lot of installs in very close quarter applications, right? Some of the states, uh, Seattle and Washington uh, and parts of California where people walk around with decibel meters in their pocket, right? Because the houses are stacked in six inches from each other. So it's extremely important for these units to be ultra quiet and we definitely take care of that very well. So generally, it'll be when it's extremely hot or extremely cold that these units would essentially be at their highest levels of decibel rating, right? Their fans will be at the highest range, the compressors will be at the highest range. And generally, I say your windows and doors should be closed by then anyway, and you probably won't hear it. So. Another, this was a, a installation in uh, just uh, out near Reno, Nevada, going back out there again next week. So light commercial application. All of these units too, uh, keep in mind, can be uh, installed together, right? If maybe one of these units doesn't quite cover the load, there could be two, there could be three. We have installations with 10, 12, 15, 20 units, okay? It offers some of these uh, larger, efficient commercial buildings to be extremely efficient when they need to be, right? When, with a fully inverter system on 10 units, we're talking, we're gonna be able to turn a 250,000 BTU capacity system all the way down to the lowest turndown of one unit, right? So there's really some incredible good flexibility, not to mention the redundancy, if by chance there's one unit that may need a service or an update. So I think with that, I'm gonna throw the last one up to remind you that we're at B60, oh, B3061. And you can uh, also grab, we have some literature there on the table. Um, if you're interested in that, I'm pretty sure we have a minute or two for a question if anybody has one if not um we're all pretty big people so they'll have to throw us out if they want us out we can talk afterwards so um uh, you know other than that um, anything we want to go in depth a little more we can we can touch base on it